We're going to be in James chapter 3. You can do something while, uh, while I'm getting ready here. James chapter 3 this morning. We're going to be taking a look at what James has to say about being a good steward, a good steward of our tongue. Amen. And the words that come out of our mouth. Nobody needs to hear this one this morning, right? I'm having all kinds of problems up here this morning. I'm sorry. Technology, specifically Apple iPads. Ugh. Okay, now that I can see, <clears throat> we're going to take a look at what being a good steward of our tongue looks like according to James. And stewardship, we'll start with this. We'll start with the definition of stewardship. Stewardship, by definition, is the conducting, supervising, or managing of something, especially the careful and responsible management of something entrusted to one's care. And some of you are already smiling because you're thinking about the tongue and careful and responsible management of something entrusted to one's care. God has given each and every one of us tongues, right? And he says, be careful and be responsible with your tongue because it has the power to bless people, but it also has the power to curse people. Some fun facts about the tongue this morning, just to kind of break the ice. The tongue is the fastest healing muscle in your body. Did you know that? Fastest healing muscle in your body. It's the only muscle in your body that is attached only at one end. And in proportion to its size, the tongue is the strongest muscle in your body. In other words, it's powerful in more ways than one. Have you ever bit your tongue? Yeah, it sends shockwaves through your entire body, right? Sometimes biting our tongue causes us to have words that are out of control, amen? <laughs> that's, that's why we're talking about this this morning. The tongue is a major part of your body, and yet we often give it little, if any, thought until we have those moments where we bite it. If you have kids or you've ever worked with kids at some point, um, and I know this happens in our house, you know, inevitably a kid comes running up to us and they want to tell us what one of the other kids did, right? Johnny did such and such, or, or Thomas did such and such, and, and, and we're just, they want to do what? They want to be a tattletale, right? And we look at them and we say, go play and don't be a tattletale, because we just don't want to hear it, right? No one likes a tattletale. You see, the tongue is really a representation of who you are. When's the last time you thought about it that way? The tongue is a representation of who you are. It's a tattletale. Your tongue is a tattletale, and it tells on your heart. How do I know this? Jesus said in Matthew chapter 12, and James addresses this at length in James chapter 3, which is where we'll be in a minute, but in Matthew chapter 12, Jesus is addressing the Pharisees. After they've suggested that he was casting out demons in the name of Beelzebub. And he says in verses 34 and 35, You brood of vipers, talking to the Pharisees, how can you who are evil say anything good? For out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. The good man brings good things out of the good stored up in him, and the evil man brings evil things out of the evil stored up in him. So the tongue is the revealer of the heart. Did you get that? The tongue is the revealer of your heart. It's been calculated that the words that we speak each day are enough to fill a 54-page book every single day. Think about that. That's a lot. In one year, the average person speaks enough words to produce 66, uh, 66 800-page books. You speak enough words every year to, speak, to, to produce 66 800-page books. It's also been suggested that men speak about 25,000 words per day, and women speak about 30 words per day. And the problem with this statistic, and some men are saying, no, 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 you got that wrong. <laughs> I'm glad you're awake this morning. This is fun. <laughs> We're going to have a good morning. The problem with that statistic, though, is that by the time the man gets home from work, he's used up all 25,000 words. And his wife is just getting started. Amen? <laughs> In James chapter 3, we see the matter of the tongue being presented as a test of living faith. Because according to James, true faith will be demonstrated by our speech. 
and so will false faith. In fact, this is so important to James that he mentions the tongue in every single chapter of his book. He mentions it twice in chapter 1, verses 19 and 26, chapter 2, verse 12, chapter 4, verse 11, chapter 5, verse 12, and he spends 12 verses of chapter 3 dealing specifically with the matter of the tongue. James was teaching that when a person gives their life over to Christ, there should be evidence of that salvation in the way that they act and in the way they relate to others and and, in the way they conduct their business. And now he's saying here in chapter 3 that the evidence of of that salvation should also show up in the way that we talk, the words that come out of our mouths. In other words, if you've truly had a heart conversion when you've given your life to Christ— And if you've truly had a renewing of your mind, then your speech, your tongue, will tell on your heart. And by your speech, your new life will be evident to others. The mouth is the monitor of the human condition. As a result, right words would be the manifestation of a righteous life. So in chapter 3, James James calls us to measure our speech to see if it's consistent with what we claim to be the reality of our faith. Does the speech and the words that come out of your mouth, do they match up with what you claim to be as a Christian? And can others see that? Controlling our tongue is essential to our Christian walk, and often we give it very little thought. And James is going to give us five compelling reasons to control our tongue. And since he gives us five reasons, that means I have five points. So you can start counting when the time will be up and all that stuff, okay? So the first thing is this. We should control our tongue because of its potential to condemn. We should control our tongue because its potential to condemn is so great. Wow, that's tiny. Can you all read that? All right, okay. I can't. Maybe that means I'm getting old and need glasses. Okay. <laughs> Control our tongue because of its, its potential to condemn is, so, condemn is so great. James chapter 3, verses 1 and 2, he says this. Not many of you should presume to be teachers, my brothers, because you will know, because you know that we who teach will be judged more strictly. We all stumble in many ways. If anyone is never at fault in what he says, he is a perfect man, able to keep his whole body in check. Mm, yeah. Why does James start with teachers? Teachers in, in James' time, teachers were of the utmost importance in society when this was written. They played a critical role. They were highly respected, and all the teachers say, Amen. Amen. Okay, a few of you here this morning. People aspired to the position of teacher because of the status that it brought with it. It's been said that teachers were of such importance during that time that if a child's teacher and parents were kidnapped, the teacher should be the first one ransomed because the parents brought the child into the world, but the teacher would prepare the child for their future and the world hereafter. That's how highly looked upon teachers were. James is warning teachers that because they chose this profession, they need to understand that there is greater condemnation should they fail. And as Christians, we have a responsibility to our friends and to our family and our children and our neighbors and to new Christians that we come into contact with, that if we're going to teach, if we're going to speak into their lives, then we must teach God's truth and not the truth as we see it. Not the truth as the world defines it, but the truth as God defines it. And when James finishes addressing teachers, he moves on to everyone else. And he says in verse 2, he says, we all stumble in many ways. If anyone is never at fault, he says, he's a perfect man, able to keep his entire body in check. That's a huge statement. James is saying everyone sins. He says everyone sins. No one's exempt. Just because pastor preaches this message today doesn't mean you're going to walk out of here and get everything right with everything you do and everything you say from now on. But James is trying to get us to think about the words that come out of our mouths. He says, everyone sins. No one's exempt. And scripture backs this up. Paul says, there is no one righteous. No, not one. 1 John 1, 8 says, there is not a righteous man on earth who does good and never sins. Romans 3, 23 says, for all have sinned. And fall short of the glory of God. The point that James is 
about to make in the coming verses is that we all sin. And the easiest way to sin is with our mouth. Why? Because we can say anything we want. We may not be able to do anything we want, but we can always say anything we want. When we're born, you know, especially parents of teenagers, I'm sure you'll agree with this, but when we were born, we should have come with a warning label that says, beware of mouth, right? Yeah. All the parents of the teenagers in here are like, amen, yeah. <laughs> beware of mouth. People have quick and sharp tongues. And sometimes you see those people coming, and they don't even need the label on their shirt that says, beware of mouth. You just know, Right? Or you look at your phone and you're like, oh, no, this isn't happening today. I'm not answering that call. And you put it back, right? Nobody ever does that. <laughs> Throughout Scripture, we see references to the disaster of the mouth. The Bible refers directly or indirectly to a wicked tongue, a deceitful tongue, a lying tongue, a perverse tongue, a crafty tongue, a flattering tongue, a blaspheming tongue, a cursing tongue, a sensual tongue, a vile tongue, and I just cut out about 20 of them that I had listed here for you. But do any of those hit close to home? Have you ever experienced that? Or maybe those words have come out of your mouth? It's no wonder God put our tongue in a cage behind our teeth, walled in by our mouth. <laughs> I'm never going to get through this. I had the same problem last night. Okay. So would it be safe to say that many of our problems are caused by our tongue? Many of the problems in our workplace, many of the problems in our relationships. I'll be the first one to confess I've got a quick tongue. It's caused me more problems than I care to admit. It's caused me more relationship problems, whether it's with my wife or with my kids or with my, my friends than I care to admit through the years. Most of our problems are caused by our tongue. Somebody once said, remember, your tongue is in a wet place and it can slip easily. <laughs> Look back at Matthew chapter 12 with me for a minute. I think it's going to come up on the screen. We read some of this already, but I'm going to continue on. I'm just going to go back to verse 34. It says, you brood of vipers, how can you who are evil say anything good? For the mouth speaks what the heart is full of. A good man brings good things out of the good stored up in him, and an evil man brings evil things out of the evil stored up in him. He goes on, but I tell you that everyone will have to give an account on the day of judgment for every empty word they have spoken. For by your words you will be acquitted, and by your words you will be condemned. James wants us to understand that our words can be a blessing or our words can be a curse. He wants us to understand that our words, our tongue, will divulge the true reality of our heart, who we are inside. He wants us to understand that the words we speak will leave a lasting impression and a lasting impact on those who hear those words and who we come into contact with. Did you know scientists say that the sound waves set in motion by every voice go on an endless journey through space? And if we had the right instruments, delicate and sophisticated enough, and the power to recapture those sound waves, we could recreate every word that ever, every person has ever spoken. What if that machine existed today? Are there words that you would be afraid to have played back for other people to hear? We have to control our tongue because of its great potential to condemn. Secondly, we have to control our tongue because it has such power to control. It has such power to control. James says in verse 2, if anyone is never at fault in what he says, he's a perfect man, able to keep his whole body in check. I've got a fun little video. It's black and white. Kids, I know some of you have never seen black and white. It's okay. There's nothing wrong with the screen, all right? But take... <laughs> Take a look at this video. It's not 4K either, I'm sorry. Um, take a look at this video about controlling the tongue. I hope I'm not disturbing anything. No, I was expecting a headache anyway. <laughs> Come on, buddy, that's 25 cents. All right, Come my on. pleasure, here you are. What, what are they doing? Well, we have a new rule. Every time Buddy insults you, he has to donate 25 cents to charity. You mean every time he has to pay? Yes, and all the money goes to aid mental health. 
Mental health? Yeah, we're trying to discover a cure for baldness of the brain. I get a copy of the sketch, Bill. Hey, Sally, what'll it cost me to call him a big blubber-nosed baboon? Oh, that'll run you roughly 75 cents. Can't afford it. You're not a big blubber-nosed baboon. You're a small blubber-nosed baboon. Rob? Come on, buddy. Well, Mel, is Alan ready to hear the sketch? Yes, and I hope it's good. Oh, it is? Then I'll read it to Alan. You are going to read our comedy sketch to Alan? Why not? That's like Benedict Arnold reading the Declaration of Independence. <laughs> well, I think it would be better if we read the sketch to Alan. All right, all right, I'll buy that. I, I hope it's funny. It will be. Come on, gang. No, oh, wait a minute. You and Sally read, not him. What do you want me to do? <clears throat> You can... <laughs> That's for what I was thinking. I hope I'm not... We laugh, but the reality is, is that many of us would be broke if we had to drop money in a can every time we said something hurtful or said what we really wanted to let somebody know was on our mind, right? The tongue, because, because the tongue is the instant expression of the heart, because it can sin more readily and more often than any other member of the body just because of circumstances and because the tongue can sin so easily because it's such a monitor of your heart and who you are on the inside, if you can control the tongue, the greater sinner in your body, you should be able to control the rest of your body, the lesser sinner. So if we want better control of our lives especially our spiritual life, James is saying to each and every one of us today, get control of your tongue. <laughs> Psalm 39, 1 says, I said, I will guard my ways that I may not sin with my tongue. I will guard my mouth as with a muzzle. Once James has given us this introduction and laid out the problem, he gives us two illustrations that kind of help us make sense of all this. He goes on in verse 3, and he says, When we put bits into the mouths of horses to make them obey us, we can turn the whole animal. It's a great illustration. How is it that a one-pound, six-inch bit can control a thousand-pound animal? I'll tell you, that bit, when you place it in the horse's mouth properly, and combined with the bridle and the reins and a skilled rider, that bit lays between the teeth of the horse. And when the rider wants to go one direction or the other direction or wants to stop, he applies pressure to the reins, which in turn causes the bit to put pressure on the horse's tongue. The bit puts pressure on the horse's tongue. In other words, listen to this, when you control the horse's tongue, you control the entire body. Get it? James was a very relevant speaker in his time and still relevant today, very culturally in touch. They understood horses, and he says, look, you can control this thousand-pound animal by putting a little bit of pressure on its tongue. Control the mouth, control the body. How many horses have you ever known to show up voluntarily to plow a field or pull a wagon or carry a rider? They don't just show up and say, hey, hop on. <laughs> Without something putting pressure on the horse's tongue, its life would be useless. You see where I'm going with this? By controlling the tongue, the whole life is directed to a useful purpose. James moves on in verse 4, and he gives another illustration. He says, or take ships as an example. Although they are so large and are driven by strong winds, they are steered by a very small rudder wherever the pilot wants to go. Rudders on a ship, at least during those days, and if you think about the massive cruise ships now, it's still pretty much true. But rudders on a ship during those days were less than 2% of the total ship. Less than 2% of the total ship. But without engines, those ships could only be powered by the wind. And so as a result, in the absence of a controlling mechanism, a rudder, the wind could easily drive a ship anywhere it wanted to go. It could drive a ship to its destruction. 
without a rudder. But with a helmsman controlling the rudder, that, that little less than 2% piece of the ship, the ship can be navigated safely wherever they want it to go. So again, just as with the bit, if you control the smallest part of the vessel, you control the whole thing. The point is this. Power applied at the right point is efficient to control the whole vessel. Did you get that? Power applied at the right point is sufficient to control the whole vessel. And power applied to the right point being our mouths is sufficient to control the whole person. Control the tongue because of its power to control you. Small part, big influence. You with me? So how do we put this in practical terms? Speak only gracious words. Speak only loving words or true words or thoughtful words. Speak only words of wisdom, words of thanksgiving, selfless words, peaceful words. If you do this, you'll control every other part of your life. Because the only way you can do all of that is by being under the power of the Spirit of God. Another reason James gives for controlling the tongue is because of its peril to corrupt. It's peril to corrupt. He says in verses 5 and 6, he says, Likewise, the tongue is a small part of the body, but it makes great boasts. Consider what a great forest is set on fire by a small spark. He says, The tongue also is a fire, a world of evil among the parts of the body. It corrupts the whole person, sets the whole course of life of his life on fire, and is itself set on fire by hell. In 2007, California had a fire. It was called the Buckwheat Fire. I know California's had lots of fires, but uh, this is the one I zeroed in on. It was called the Buckwheat Fire. This Buckwheat Fire scorched 38,000 acres of land. That's 60 square miles. The fire destroyed 21 homes. And the reason that I picked this one to tell you about is because the fire was set by a 10-year-old boy playing with matches in the backyard of his home. That match slipped from his fingers, and that fire impacted people for 60 square miles. Fire has amazing capacity. If I had a cup of water up here with me, if I had a cup of water up here and I poured it out, it doesn't multiply, right? The carpet would get wet right here. You all would stay dry. Everything would be okay. I pour the cup of water out right here, and everything's fine. It doesn't turn into a flood. However, if I have one match up here, and I strike it and light it, and I drop it right here on the stage, how many of you are going to stay here to listen to me preach? <laughs> I'm not staying here to listen to me preach. Why? Because that fire spreads, and it burns, and it multiplies. So James wants us to understand and wants us to see that our tongue has the same potential as fire. The words spoken by our mouths and by our tongues can spread like fire. They can destroy people's lives. They can destroy people's relationships. They can cost you your job. Proverbs 16, 27 says, An ungodly man digs up evil, and in his lips there is a burning fire. Morgan Blake, a writer for the Atlanta Journal, wrote this. He said, I am more deadly than a screaming shell from a howitzer. I win without killing. I tear down homes. I break hearts, and I wreck lives. I travel on the wings of wind. No innocence is strong enough to intimidate me. No purity pure enough to daunt me. I have no regard for truth, no respect for justice, no mercy for the defenseless. My victims are numerous as the sands of the sea and often as innocent. I never forget and I seldom forgive and my name is gossip. That's why Proverbs chapter 10 verse 19 says, he who restrains his lips is wise. Don't be fuel for anybody's fire. Don't be the wood or the coal that keeps that fire burning, and, and don't look for fires to start. Fourth, we must control the tongue because of its primitiveness to combat. What do I mean by primitiveness? Your tongue is primitive. It's wild. It's untamed. It's savage at times. It's uncivilized and undisciplined at times. 
and it can be terribly irresponsible. The tongue will combat every effort to control it. The tongue wants to control. It doesn't want to be controlled. Notice what James says in verses 7 and 8. He says, All kinds of animals, birds, reptiles, and creatures of the sea are being tamed and have been tamed by man. Verse 8, But no man can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil full of deadly poison. Clear back at the beginning of time, God gave man the ability to tame his creation. He told us to subdue it and rule over it. Even when Noah had to load up the ark, God gave him the ability to control the animals that had to be put into that ark. But according to James, no man has the ability to tame the tongue. He doesn't say that it can't be tamed. He just says that man can't tame it. You following me? He's not saying your tongue can't be tamed. He's just saying no man, no woman can tame it. Our tongues can only be tamed by the grace, of, the grace and the power of God working through us. When we fill our hearts with God and we accept his grace and his forgiveness and we allow him to transform us, he can tame our tongue, but we can't. There's no other way. Finally, the tongue must be controlled because of its propensity to compromise. Propensity to compromise. Verse 9 through 12 says this. With the tongue we praise our Lord and Father, and with it we curse men who have been made in God's likeness. Out of the same mouth come praise and cursing. My brothers, this should not be. Can both fresh water and salt water flow from the same spring? My brothers, can a fig tree bear olives or a grapevine bear figs? Neither can a salt spring produce fresh water. What's he saying? James is saying, without the power of God controlling your tongue, your tongue is a hypocrite. You come to church and you sing praise to God. But then when you walk outside the doors of this church, you carry on conversations that are less than pleasing to God, or you walk out of here and you destroy somebody's character, or you tear them down piece by piece with the words that you say. James is saying you can't sit on the fence. You can't have your cake and eat it too. You can't say hurtful, slanderous, and malicious things part of the time and then flip a switch and come in these doors and sing praises to my name and think everything's okay. It shouldn't be that way. It can't be that way. He's saying if you're a Christian, then you should be producing the kind of fruit that a Christian should produce. Kind words, encouraging words, uplifting words. One author said, Many a man speaks with perfect courtesy to strangers and even preaches love and gentleness and yet snaps with impatient irritability at his own family. It has not been unknown for a man to speak with piety on Sunday and to curse a squad of workmen on Monday. It has not been unknown for a man to utter the most pious sentiments one day and to repeat the most questionable stories the next. It has not been unknown for a woman to speak with sweet graciousness at a religious meeting and then to go outside to murder someone's reputation with a malicious tongue. James says these things shouldn't be happening in the church, in the lives of Christians. The tongue can bless or the tongue can curse. It can wound or it can soothe. It can speak the fairest or it can speak the foulest of things. And as a Christian, it's one of the hardest things to make sure that your tongue doesn't contradict itself, but that it speaks only words that we would want God to hear. As we close and the band comes back, listen to these words from Luke chapter 6, verse 43. Luke 6, 43 says, No good tree bears bad fruit, nor does a bad tree bear good fruit. Each tree is recognized by its own fruit. People do not pick figs from thorn, br thorn bushes or grapes from briars. A good man brings good things out of the good that's stored up in his heart. And an evil man brings evil things out of the evil stored up in his heart. For the mouth speaks what the heart is full of. When James wrote verses 9 through 12, I believe he was reflecting on what the Lord had said in Luke chapter 6. I think he had that in his mind as he wrote. So to sum everything up this morning, James warns us of two things. He says, we're revealed by our mouth. 
who we really are inside, we are revealed by our mouth. So what's your heart look like this morning? Who are you inside, the real you? Because at some point in your life, your mouth is going to reveal that to others. So he says, we're revealed by our mouth. And the second thing is, is he says, our mouth has tremendous potential for disaster. Tremendous potential for disaster. Beware of mouth. But if we'll tame our tongue through the power of God, it will be evident to others that we are a Christian, and it will be evident that we're walking in obedience to his commands. With every head bowed, every eye closed, we're going to pray. Just take a minute with your eyes closed, not looking around. Just take a minute to reflect on the words that have been coming out of your mouth lately. The words that you've been saying to your coworkers, to your spouse, to your children, to your friends. What can we do about what we heard today? We can own up to the fires that we've started. You can take responsibility and stop talking, maybe. Think about what you can do to put out fires that you've started so that the healing process can begin. You can surrender your mouth to God daily by spending time in his word through devotions or when you get out of bed in the morning, just say, God, I know, I know that I should have a sticker on my, on my mouth that says, beware of mouth. But God, this morning I give you my words and I give you my tongue and I, I ask you to fill my heart. Help me to speak only helpful words, words that are going to build others up. Ask God to transform your heart and your mind so that the overflow that comes out of your heart, that comes from within, is pleasing to God and pleasing to others. Lord, thank you for the words of James this morning and the insight that he shared with us about the, the power of the tongue. Your words in Proverbs 10 say, When words are many, sin is not absent, but he who holds his tongue is wise. And today, Lord, I pray that you'll help each of us as we work to hold our tongue and avoid starting unnecessary fires, Lord. I pray that you'll help us and give us the strength and, and help us to think about the words that are about to come out of our mouth, whether they're going to build somebody up or whether they're going to tear somebody down. Lord Jesus, be with your people this week as they, as they go their separate ways, Lord. Help their conversations to be full of grace, encouraging to one another so that others might see you through them and, and, and hear you through the words that they speak. We love you, God, and we thank you that your word is relevant and current for today and that it gives us the guidance and direction that we need not just to live good, healthy, productive lives here, Lord Jesus, but to become more like you. Lord Jesus, help us this week as we work to tame our tongues to get to control of the words that we say so that we can win the respect of others, and so that someday when we stand before you, our words won't condemn us, but instead our words, because of the words that we spoke, you'll look at us and say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. We love you, Jesus. I pray that you'll be with your people this week. Bring us back safe next week as we continue to worship you and seek your face and grow to be more like you in 2016. In Jesus' precious name we pray, amen. Amen. God bless you guys. It's been great to be with you. I had a great time this morning. Can't wait to see you next week. Have a great week.